Good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Oak Park. I'm Deaconess W. Spear, recording today from our new youth room, which you may not have had an opportunity to see yet. Uh, I am recording up here because our building is um, in good use today. The Fellowship Hall is a uh, shelter currently for Housing Forward. And our sanctuary has a small uh, learning pod in it, students from the area that are doing their remote learning together. So uh, it's good to have some people in the building, and I can't wait till it's our worshiping community being together fully. There are several links available in our Prayers and More forum, which can be accessed uh, through our Facebook comments today, uh, YouTube comments also under the service there, and also on our website uh, homepage. One of the links you will find is for an important survey being uh, put out by our anti-racism task force. This survey will help to gauge where we are as a congregation and where we need to go. So please take a moment to complete that survey. You will also find links to two upcoming Bible uh, study opportunities. The first is Sundays today at 1030 a.m. studying the book of Luke. And the second begins tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. And that is a study on the water-connected stories in the Bible, which connects to our Lenten theme of watermarks. Of course, the prayers and more form can also be used to share your prayer requests, to link to our donation page, and to request visitor information. If you would like information about any of these things, uh, you can also check out our website or reach out to the church office. This week marks the beginning of Lent with Ash Wednesday. You'll be receiving either by mail or porch drop off um, a bag of materials that uh, will take you through the first part of the season of Lent. There will be ashes for our Ash Wednesday service. Uh, there will be a booklet that contains um, much of the information that you will need for different activities that we will be doing during the season of Lent and a few other um, items that uh, we hope will enrich your Lenten season. And finally, um, this Friday is our jazz prayer service at 7.30 p.m. with the theme of compassion. On this Valentine's Day, we are celebrating Relationship Sunday with a collection of pictures of those couples celebrating a anniversary divisible by five. So we want to wish a happy anniversary to those couples. And finally, faith community, let us take a moment to pause before we join together in worship. Let our worship begin. Christiane Broyer. I'm Peter Hugh. And we're married <laughs> for almost 25 years in April 21st. Oh no, 20th, 20th. actually. <laughs> 21st is his birthday, and we got married the day before his birthday in hopes I'd remember this day, but obviously I'm still working on that. <laughs> right. When did you get married? Well, I'm Paul Peterson, and uh, I'm Richard Sell. And we got married in uh, 2016, so we're, we'll be married five years in October, um, but we've been together for um, 11 years. And after many years of uh, meeting um, partners and boyfriends in different places, 
we finally settled on the final one um, by meeting each other at church. Um, we were in the same new member class um, at the Cathedral of Hope in Dallas, Texas. We don't have any kids, but we do have we do have a new puppy, and we have um, three cats: two boys and one girl. When we met, uh, she had two cats. I had one, so. Um, we can relate. <laughs> Very nice. Well, as soon as we got a, a house, we got the dog that I always wanted. So we're, well, we're a dog family now. Well, congratulations on um, 25 years of marriage. Thank and you. Um, may uh, God's peace be with you. You too, Richard and Paul. Peace to you both. And peace to you all, a good shepherd. Peace to you. What they said. Hello, I'm Donna Schwartz, and this is my husband. Bill Schwartz. And we, we met a long time ago because 50 never <laughs> looked so good. <laughs> <laughs> we met at a party in uh, Wheaton. And um, I was teaching there, and she was in, in nursing school. And she came to visit the party um, with a group of girls. And, um, and that was it. That was it, yeah. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. All right. Cool. Hi. I'm Linda Fisher, and this is my husband, Carl Fisher. And we've been married 45 years in May. And we met at the wedding of Linda's cousin Steve, who was the first person that I met when my family moved from Ohio to <clears throat> Illinois. Our meeting was purely serendipitous. We were going to his wedding. Each of our dates stood us up. So we <laughs> arrived dateless. We met by a um, washer and dryer in the basement of Steve's mother's home. <laughs> her mother played matchmaker. Uh, I invited her to my table. Uh, she caught the bouquet at the wedding. And I'll let Linda tell, uh, tell you how it is she found where I lived in Champaign. Well, then we parted with uh, maybe we'll write. So then I got home and I thought, well, I should probably write to this guy. He was a really nice guy, but I don't have his address. So that was when you could call Four one, I think it was 411 and get a phone number. And I said, do you have a yeah. phone number for Carl Fisher in Champaign-Urbana? And they said, oh, the one on 909 South Wright Street. And I said, oh, that sounds good. So I just got the letter mm. and he got it. <laughs> okay, we'll turn it over to the next couple. Hi, I'm Peggy Cinco. Yeah. Ken Cinco. And uh, we were married 45 years ago last Sunday on February wow. 7th. Uh, and we uh, met at the now torn down Mollering Library at Valparaiso University, uh, where we were being set up by a mutual friend. <clears throat> and uh, the rest is history. Go ahead. Okay, I'm Susan Greeley. And just to confuse everybody, I'm Jeff King. <laughs> and we will be married 25 years in October. But all of our history wraps around church stuff. Um, we met at a national convention, which in e ELCA parlance is at a national churchwide assembly. And I had been asked if I could work uh, a camera, television camera, and she was the floor director. And we um, were all locking down the cameras and everything. And we had all decided that we and the rest of the, the crew decided we go out to dinner. And when we turned around, everybody else was gone. It was just the two of us. And I said, do you want to go to, to dinner anyway? And she said, sure. And as each of you has said, and that's the story. 
<laughs> the only other thing that's interesting is that we did get married um, at Good Shepherd uh, during a Sunday morning worship service. Um, Remember, so there were lots yeah. of people at our wedding, um, mm -hmm. and that was very, uh, very memorable and and really lovely. The Lord be with you all, and also the with, Lord. You. with you. Lord be with you. Lord. Lord. God's peace, Carl and Linda, peace to the Lord, Donna and Bill. Thank you. Peace to you too. We have seen the light of God on high mountains of celebration and in the ecstasy of a lover's embrace. We have seen the light of God through the bitter scorn of betrayal and the searing chasm of grief. We have seen the light of God with eyes that have been shaded, with eyes that have been opened, with eyes that have been blinded, we have seen the light of God. Boy, I'm Ralph. He's Fred. You know, he needs me for these things. Yeah, that's true. Sure do. And um, you need me. Yeah, you can't go anywhere without me. <laughs> right? Mm, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Ralph, what makes today special? Well, um, 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 it's a mountaintop day. Well, uh, that's not what we usually call it. I know. But that other word is too hard. You mean transfiguration? That's the one. And uh, what else about it? What? It's up on the mountain. Yeah, and Jesus really liked to go up on, on mountains. Uh, he sometimes went up there. To pray, I guess you kind of feel closer to God if you're up there. That's right. Lots of people thought that. I even kind of think that. Because when I was a, a kid, we lived for a while way up in the mountains in Colorado, in about almost 10,000 feet up in, the, uh, up in the mountains. And I would go up above the town and I would look out to the west and I would see this whole lineup of mountains that all had snow on them. Wow. Yeah, it was really a wow, all right. And they were called the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, the Blood of Christ Mountains. Well, well we don't have to worry too much about that. Okay. Um, let's see. It was a special day for Jesus, right? Yeah, you could say that. Uh, he took uh, three of his main guys along with him, Peter, James, and John, and uh, something happened up there. What, a surprise? Yeah, even like a surprise birthday party? <laughs> I guess you could say that. Yeah, that's, that's really a pretty good way to look at it. And what else? Well, he had surprise guests that came to see him up there. Yeah, who? Moses and Elijah. Hmm? Well, you could kind of think of them as um, uh, distant relatives from a long time ago. And why them? Well, they were pretty special, you know, Moses and Elijah. Moses was... Uh, Kind of like the one who led the people and, and uh, helped them uh, become a nation way back in, in history. You mean kind of like George Washington? Very good, Ralph. Very good. But how about that Elijah guy? Well, he was one who uh, tried to keep people on God's uh, path, going in the right direction. You mean kind of like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Mm hmm. Very, very good, Ralph. I really like that. So it's kind of like we have George Washington, the father of the country, and, and Martin Luther King Jr., like a, a prophet uh, of our own time, 
yeah, that really works. And they were there because why? Well, I think it may have had something to do with Jesus uh, looking forward to what was going to be happening. Uh, what? Well, he was going to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But rise again, right? Yes, Ralph. Yes, indeed. He was going to rise again. But in the meantime, he needed to have this kind of something to burst up, uh, back up his courage to make things look better for himself. Uh, and just kind of take a look around at the whole big picture up there in the mountaintop so that he wouldn't get lost down there in too many details. Okay, and that's why, uh, why we get together and celebrate on this. You can say it now? No, you go for it. Transfiguration Sunday. Yeah, that's the one. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And when we all get together, not just three disciples, not just Moses and Elijah, but when we all get together, and especially when we'll be able to get together again uh, in person, we'll, be, uh, we'll be, be there to be with God coming close to us too. And in the meantime, we know that God is always close to us in our families, with the people who love us and that we love, and, uh, and that God is always with us to buck us up and kind of put us up on the mountaintop. So that makes us God's people too. You betcha, and I couldn't have said it any better myself. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. Bye now.
us pray. Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, whose compassion illumines the world. Transform us into the likeness of the love of Christ, who renewed our humanity so that we may share in his divinity. The same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. First, a little background. The spotlight of Christian ministry is not on the people who carry out ministry, but on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as God made light shine at creation, God makes the light of Jesus Christ shine in our lives through Christian ministry. The reading begins. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. A reading from the 50th Psalm. The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken, calling the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. With a consuming flame before and round about a raging storm. God calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of the people. Gather before me my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the rightness of God's cause, for it is God who is judge. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in this world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking to Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. The Word of Our Lord The passage before our Gospel story today is where Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? A variety of answers are given. And then Jesus asked them, Who do you say that I am? There's a few moments of awkward silence, which finally ends when Simon Peter blurts out, You are the Messiah. Immediately Jesus begins to tell them the ending of the story about how he will go to Jerusalem where he will be tortured and killed. Obviously, when Simon Peter tells Jesus that he was the Messiah, he had some thoughts about what that meant. The Messiah was powerful. The Messiah was protected. He doesn't say what he thinks that the Messiah is, 
what he does say is, no, you can't die. And Jesus swiftly rebukes Simon Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Suddenly, the room is filled with tension and an awkward silence again, which our story indicates lasted six days. Six days later, Jesus finally takes Simon Peter, along with James and John, up to a mountain. It's there that Jesus changes for a moment, and again Simon Peter sees something, and again he gets the whole thing wrong. Let's stay here. I can build some tents here. Didn't Jesus just say six days beforehand, we're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be tortured and killed. Simon just can't process that information. But we really can't criticize too harshly, can we? It's difficult to fully understand what is meant when we call Jesus the Christ. In the first centuries, there were all kinds of stories circulating about what that meant. Some people began with the Christ. They saw the divinity most clearly. The story of Jesus glowing and God's voice booming, this is my child, was one that they lifted up. In those days, the children of a God was considered, well, a God. One group that lifted up this belief was the Gnostics. The word gnosis means knowledge in Greek. These Gnostics felt that they had some very special knowledge about Jesus Christ that other Christians were just plain lacking. And one piece of knowledge was what happened on the cross. Everyone understood that gods can't die and the one who created everything was intricately involved with his continued existence. So they couldn't die because everything would die. So there had to have been a switch, perhaps at the trial, maybe at the cross, perhaps just at the moment of death. A different human took on the place of Jesus Christ who was able to make that human look like Jesus. Another idea was just that Christ just looked like he was dead, but he really wasn't dead at the time. Either way, the divinity of Jesus Christ controlled what happened to the humanity, what happened to the body. Before you lift them up as heretics, and yes, I know that is what we call the Gnostics, it is a heresy, I remind you that thinking that about um, our understanding of Jesus Christ as divinity that thinking sneaks up in all kinds of other ways. Wasn't it just six weeks ago that we were singing this wonderful hymn, Away in the Manger? And what about that line? The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Whoops, really? Are there babies that never cry? Hmm. Much is written about the holiness of Jesus, how he never went through the terrible twos or the rebellious teens. Well, except that time when he stayed back at the temple teaching the priests. But then again, wasn't he just really showing his divinity at that moment? He couldn't really have been going against that commandment. You know, the one about dishonoring one's parents. On the polar opposite are the people who lift up the humanity of Jesus as primary. They struggle sometimes to find evidence of the divinity of Christ. Those people, most likely, most notably, the Jesus Seminar um, folks with Marcus Borg, they point out that the phrase Son of God was used for, well, quite frankly, all kinds of kings. People gave the kings respect and honor, but they didn't really believe that they were gods. They even had virgin birth stories for all kinds of different kings at the time period, Jesus was a prophet, a healer, with the honorific title of Messiah, Christ. What is interesting is that the Council of Nicaea settled the matter by choosing both sides. Jesus as Christ is both 100% divine and 100% human. Divinity retains 100% of its power. Humanity retains 100% of its uniqueness, including a need for rest and food and time away from people who just don't understand you must be why Jesus was always going up to those mountains to pray. Yet even this understanding leaves more questions than answers. The human brain develops in stages. 
When was Jesus aware of his unique nature? Hmm. The unique psyche, or the human psyche, avoids pain. Was Jesus afraid when he learned that his mission was to die? Did he just want to protect himself, and did he have to restrain himself from using that power? Remember, today's gospel comes six days after Jesus admits, admits that he is the Messiah and is destined to die. Six days after Simon Peter tempts him, tempts him with protecting himself. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> the Reverend Dr. John Teachin wrote a wonderful book that's titled The Gospel According to Jesus. Some of you might even remember the Reverend Dr. Teachin. He was at the center of the Missouri Synod, Synod controversy regarding the interpretation of Scripture. He became the president of the newly formed Christ Seminary Seminex. And when the ELCA was formed, he became Bishop of Metro Chicago for a brief time. By all accounts, a well-respected theologian. Teachin takes the story from the four Gospels, four Gospel writers, and makes one story written in the first person through the eyes of Jesus. And the story of the Transfiguration is in his book. It is in here that Jesus has had this pulling from within for quite some time. He has understood that his mission is all about bringing to the world this understanding of God's love and the fullness of it. But lately there's been something different pulling him in a, to do even more. As the religious leaders oppose his work, Jesus feels more compelled to tell about how the Holy Spirit is going to be moving people to love God above all else and to love others as they love themselves. And his question, who do you say that I am? Well, in the book, that question is partly for himself. God is working through him, but what does that really mean? As Simon Peter names him as Messiah, Jesus sees that they don't understand what that means for him and so he goes up to the mountain to pray. He prays for assurance about his plan to go to Jerusalem, to take his message to the religious leaders. He prays for strength to accept the suffering. And suddenly, while he's there, a bright light appears, and he realizes that the bright light is coming from within. It's then that Moses and Elijah appear. And these three start talking about the upcoming trip to Jerusalem that Jesus will be making. They all agree that it's necessary and that it will end in suffering. Moses and Elijah also point out that that light emanating from Jesus is evidence of a change that will result from his death. A change for Jesus. A change for the world. Jesus is right in sensing that his death will lead to the Holy Spirit inspiring people to love God more deeply and in a new way, and that their love for their neighbors with the fullness that they wish to be loved will also be a part of this message. In a moment, it's all over. The light is gone, gone as Moses and Elijah. Well, the teaching story, that part is over. The words that Teachin gives to Moses and Elijah, they come from our current understanding of our role as Christians. The story and the light of Jesus Christ lives on in us. The first metamorphosis, that's the Greek word for the transfiguration, the first metamorphosis happened on the mountain. It is here that Jesus gains strength for what lies ahead. He will use God's love to conquer evil, to conquer <clears throat> evil, hate, fear, suffering, and even death. The second metamorphosis happened on Easter when Jesus showed the fullness of his divinity by rising from the dead, finally showing the disciples what it meant to be the Messiah. While people were and continue to be confused about how the humanity, 100%, and the divinity, 100%, existed in Jesus Christ. They weren't confused about his message. God 
is love. Jesus Christ is love. We follow Jesus Christ by learning to love more deeply and by spreading this message that love is God's light. And just as light was shown from within Jesus so that his exterior matched the interior of his being, that same light can shine through each and every one of us. We are the light bearers. That is what it means to be a disciple. We bring light where hope is needed. We bring light where fear must be dispelled. We bring light when love is dying. We bring light in a world filled with darkness. Once upon a time, a light shone from a man named Jesus, who was now named the Messiah, the Christ. Now that light lives in you and in me. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the gospel proclaimed in word and deed, for communities of faith far and near, and for all who show the face of Christ throughout the world. Today we pray especially for congregations that are unable to pray and gather in person. Bless worship services done online and those who create them. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For creation, sun, moon, and stars, life forming in the dark earth and ocean deep, mountains, clouds, and storms, and creatures seen and unseen, and for the Holy Spirit's guidance in our stewardship of God's creation, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. 
for those responsible for safety and protection, for emergency responders and security guards, attorneys and advocates, civil servants and leaders of governments, that they witness to mercy and justice throughout the world. Today, we pray for the leaders of this nation that peace and justice reign over bitterness and division. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all who suffer this day, that Christ our healer transforms sickness into health, loneliness into companionship, bereavement into consolation, and suffering into peace. Today, we pray especially for George and Libby, for Bevan, Kathy, and Lauren. We pray in thanksgiving that our church building is able to offer shelter from the bitter cold for those resting in its warmth and for all who are without adequate shelter. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For companions on life's journey in this worshiping community, especially for those couples marking a milestone anniversary this year, for loved ones who cannot be with us this day, and for guidance during struggles we face, that God's glory is revealed around and among us. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. Dear God, you know our wants and needs, and we have so many. Please hear our prayers, spoken or unspoken. In thankful thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their earthly pilgrimage, that their lives of service and prayer inspire us in our living, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please join us in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Look to me and see Watch me enliven all of creation. My love, my grace, received with every in-breath, exchanged through each exhale. I am the God of Moses, extended an invitation to meet human feet upon high holy places where heaven met earth. I called him out to walk with me, talk, climb mountains, not only to find me somewhere, not to prove my exclusivity or supernatural divinity, I am with nothing to prove. I wish you could have seen his face, the glory of God upon him, transmitting light from me to Moses, to others, outreach to the people. But they were transfixed, people straining for twinkles of light, residue, rather than coming to the source, distance from me and my nature. I long for you to know me and gain my heart, no longer the hard-to-grasp mountaintop God that only appreciates accomplishment. 
I am. When you lose footing and slide, I am. When you encounter the wild and hide, I am. When you lose faith, dried up and blistered by wind and sun, I am with you long before the summit informing you i just keep talking about radical inclusive love as you come to know me for who i am my presence becomes your countenance you arrive at the mountaintop are gifted the big reveal. I was in you all along. You reside in me. This is the insight that brings unity, empathy for your sister, oneness with your brother. My people, discover me in one another. Thin places, consecrated ground. Heaven on earth. The Spirit of God empowers go and be and do. And may you and those you encounter and those who are touched beyond that encounter discover and know the grace and the love and the peace of God each and every day. Amen.